about a girl bathing in a waterfall. And sure enough, put the girl in the waterfall. There she is, laughing and enjoying herself. Just she alone, just she and her whole world of exhilaration, freshness. Mineral is the freshness soap. And within a very short time, it rose to the top of the premium so uh, toilet soap market. The original freshness soap with the exciting freshness of limes. There's only one way to wash, really, and once there were only half a dozen different soaps in the Indian mass market. Now, over a hundred brands jostle for different niches in the market, from street sleepers to trapped housewives. And the total number of different products on the Indian market is doubling every three years. To people raised in the Gandhian tradition of simplicity, this is quite shocking. If modernization is defined as excessive and wasteful and pre predatory consumption, you are stuck with forcing prudent societies, societies like India where austerity of the Gandhian kind was the highest form of being civilized, where people took pride in having simple homes, in having two pieces of clothes, in eating simply. Now to transform these societies into markets means you must transform the people of these societies into consumers. It'll destroy, it'll devastate this country environmentally. It's going to devastate it long before that, culturally and socially. But most Indians are a bit less Gandhian than Dr. Shiva. Like novice consumers in the West long ago, once they see it, they do want it. All of it. 100% of India's urban uh, population is exposed to TV, and almost 35% of India's rural population is exposed to TV. Now, when you see TV, what is impacting you is not merely the commercials which are shown, but the lifestyles of people that you see in various serials and programs. For example, Santa Barbara, Bold and Beautiful, these programs have been now broadcast in India for the last one year, and they are having an impact on the way people dress up, the way people talk, the way people behave. Life's irresistible. And the younger generation who's in school and college will have a different attitude towards kissing, hugging, and so on and so forth in public than my generation has had. Now, therefore, as a marketing man, where do I see the opportunity in that? See, when you want to be physically closer to people a lot, then you tend to want to look better, smell better. So there's a market going to be cosmetics, perfumes, Aftershaves, there's a bigger market that will grow for mouthwashes and so on and so forth. The changes are unstoppable. India's per capita income has grown by a third in a single decade. Foreign products like Ray-Ban sunglasses and Levi's jeans, once available only on the black market, are now everywhere. And the naive idealism of Gandhi has been replaced by an even more naive ideology of perpetual growth. Opening up of third world markets, modernization of third world economies, to find new places for investment for northern economic interests is such an important pressure that it is not just the southern consumer acting as a free agent and saying, I want more dishwashers, more vacuum cleaners, uh, more fridges, but the entire transnational economic structure needing to create the excessive, you know, com consumers in India as much as all of Europe, consumers in China even more than that. And I don't think we're going to get anywhere uh, till we learn how to make our economic system subservient to the limits of this Earth's capacity. This village is near Pune, in one of the most developed parts of India, 
But these women spend an hour a day carrying water to their houses. All rural people spend a lot of their time moving heavy things around, and almost all women in Indian villages still have to do it the hard way. But everybody in this village who can afford one buys himself a scooter. There used to be an 18-month waiting period for a scooter in India, but now that the controls are off, you can just walk in and buy one, a local one or a foreign import. Bajaj, India's biggest scooter company, fights off growing foreign competition by appealing to Indian pride in its commercials for Hamara Bajaj, our Bajaj. Bajaj already sells a million scooters a year, and the family that buys a scooter now will probably buy a car in the next generation. It was the North that led the way over the past two centuries with a huge population explosion and soaring consumption. Now one billion first world people lead stable, comfortable lives. But the game isn't over yet. It's the third world's turn. India and Indonesia and Turkey and Mexico and China, most big third world countries are now growing far faster than the developed countries. 50 years from now, there will be around 10 billion consumers on this planet. People have internalized, particularly the elites, particularly the governments, have internalized the notion that there's the linear track of progress and the West is up there and we have to follow. So that when, in international negotiations, we are told, no, now, you know, everyone can't afford fridges, otherwise there's a hole in the ozone forever after, there's a serious feeling of deprivation, that you're being stopped from doing something good. Uh, and that won't change unless there is a change in thinking which recognizes North and South that you aren't living better by being more wasteful by destroying more. Scooters and fridges and cars. 10 or 20 years and they all end up as scrap. And at every stage of the process from mining the metal to recycling the scrap, the environment pays a price. This plant buys cheap scrap steel, basically shredded car bodies, from first world countries where environmental controls are strict. And they smelt it here, where controls are lax. But it's a fantasy to imagine that the rich countries can just ship the pollution south. The earth is a closed system, and it will all come back to haunt us in the end. Civilization is, among other things, a giant machine for processing the living and mineral resources of the world into forms suitable for human consumption. And there is a view held by a number of people that since we invented civilization, we've become a cancer upon the planet. We're no longer natural. That's nonsense. Human beings are part of nature. Even our industries and our cities are perfectly natural, as natural as anthills and beaver dams. 
And if what we've started to do over the past couple of centuries should seriously alter the balance of the environment, nature won't mind. It'll simply create a new equilibrium. We, however, might have quite a lot of trouble in adjusting to the new conditions. Our species has already appropriated about 40% of the biological resources of the land surface of this planet for our own use. That leaves only 60% for the natural systems that keep the environment stable. We may already have gone too far, but the same changes that transformed the West are now sweeping across the rest of the world. When the economy changes, a lot of other changes follow. Gandhi would not recognize today's India, but then Abraham Lincoln would be stunned by modern America. One by one, all the world's cultures are being fed into an industrial strength blender. The changes uh, being introduced in societies like India which are somewhat still traditional. Even while they modernize, they maintain remnants of ways of living, different from defining yourself as a consumer and consumer alone, having other ethical fabric. Those changes, long before they kill people through environmental degradation, they kill people through cultural erosion and cultural devastation. Whether it's Punjab and the extremists there, or the other urban extremists, or the rise of the religious fundamentalists, you can at one level relate it very much to the frustrations of the youth, particularly males, born of a new greed, a new consumerism, a new culture of consumerism, which however cannot be met for all, because the economic situation of the country doesn't allow to, it to become everyone's reality. And in that climate of frustration, fundamentalism, terrorism, violence, breeds. The bomb at the Bombay Stock Exchange went off at 1.45 p.m. on the 12th of March. I went to Delhi for one day. I, I was meeting with the Editors Guild in Delhi. Phone rang. All the editors were there. I said, Bombay's under a bomb attack. At first, I thought a bomb attack from the air. And no, right on the ground, right in the middle of our city. <laughs> Thirteen massive bombs exploded in Bombay on the same day in March 1993, in retaliation for the riots two months earlier in which several thousand Muslims, the poorest of all Bombay's minorities, were slaughtered. I can't believe, you know, I just can't believe that neighbors who've been living together, Hindus and Muslims, in Bombay, living together side by side 10, 15 years. Suddenly one night wake up and say, I want to kill my neighbor. One just cannot come to grips with it. At the moment, I think we're all suffering from a kind of uh, shock. Three days later, the Bombay Stock Exchange was back in business. But the shocks will continue, and they will not be limited to the third world. Mark Twain once said that an Indian laundryman is someone who breaks stones with your shirt. 
But when he visited India a century ago, there were still huge commercial laundries in the West where they washed clothes by hand. Those jobs are all gone now in West.